a bad idea. I don't have to deny anything right now. Uh, I'm going to start out with something that's a memory test for anybody that's approaching my age. Hey there, hi there, ho there, you're as welcome as can be. Anybody tell me what that's from? Uh, you. Mickey Mouse. All right, but you're not that old. Okay, now I'm going to get on this pretty quick because i got way too much to just idle chatter. Um, Everybody knows I like to pull things apart and look at it structurally, you know, morphologically, life history, um, behavior, all of that's a really important aspect of butterfly study or any you know, study of any creature. But uh, the, the creature has to interact with its cosmos. And this interaction is described in terms of its place over time on the face of our particular planet, since that's the only one we know much about. Uh, so biogeography is an adjunct to many other sciences, and there's no naturalist who's not also a biogeographer. Study of the distribution of species spatially and temporally. It's a synthetic science, including uh, aspects of geography, biology, soil science, geology, climatology, ecology, and evolution. But it's also tied to concepts of species, and in fact, uh, when you examine the species in the context of their distribution over the planet, see that there's juxtapositions that are important and, and you have to understand these uh, juxtapositions in terms of their history, which is admittedly somewhat theoretical. Um, and we're also interested as a biogeographer in mechanisms related to the expansion and contraction of ranges. Now, of course, most of us are limited in time. Uh, some of us less so, some of us more so. But the, uh, the problem with the, with the time and temporal limitations of the human lifespan is we don't see much going on as we watch it. So we have to infer from the evidence, okay? And we're going to you know, cover some of that ground tonight. Uh, okay, the pattern of uh, species distribution across the geographic area can be explained through combination of the uh, individual species adaptability, its capacity to disperse, and then various historical factors. Uh, uh, speciation, differentiation, extinction, uh, continental drift, uh, climatic revolutions are especially important in this part of the world. And then, of course, available resources in the environment and the ability of the species to adapt to those resources. Okay, now, uh, let's see if this works. Okay, this is like a generalized map of North America, but the important thing here is I want to emphasize is butterflies are not maritime, they're not marine creatures, therefore, you know, the terrestrial limitations uh, impose themselves on butterflies. This is uh, as far north as butterflies occur, right, in this area here. And uh, actually on the, uh, this part, of the same latitude, essentially, but on this part of, of Greenland. Um, the, the, the nature of this, okay, that came out better than I thought it would. Uh, it's really important to understand the nature of, of, of a continental mass is uh, uh, very, very diverse according to the size of the continent. A small continent has less of a montane uh, element to it and you know, in contrast with the element of the plains. But one of the things that you have to look at is, is uh, what constitutes uh, a life zone. What is eligible for creatures to live on? Well, you can see that you know, they're pretty much not eligible to live uh, on ice. And it's really important when you consider uh, you know, glacial epochs because Creatures don't live on or under ice. At least that's what I think. I don't know, maybe. Gorilla <laughs> um, bladders might, I don't know. Well, uh, so cave organisms do. Yes, yeah, okay. It, it, this, this is a very generalized, and in fact, a pretty much uh, disregarded life zone uh, map. Uh, it's, it's something that's kind of become passe because, in fact, biotic zones are much more diverse, uh, and, and, and in order to taxonom uh, taxonomically array uh, you know, a, a continent the size of North America, you make so many assumptions it's better not to, all right? But you can see that there's this large uh, area, sort of a forest, taiga. They don't really show the Arctic uh, environment, which is tundra, it's treeless. Then you have these prairies, so you have a coastal zone, Piedmont, and then the Great Basin, etc. But this is more of a, of a a paradigm that shouldn't be taken too seriously than, uh, than anything else. I just wanted to show that you know a continent the size of North America can be divided into grosser regions. Now, one of the things that's very very interesting is that when you look at you know all these mountain ranges here, you know like we know that these are significant. There's butterflies that occur in mountains, 
and there's butterflies that occur in the Columbia Basin or in the Puget Trough. But um, you know, what do you think about um, you know butterflies that live in the Puget Trough ever moving up into the Columbia Basin? All right. Well, you can see that the potential for that is there along the Columbia River Gorge. And it was about five, six years ago we had a a, a, a meeting in the Columbia Gorge that talked exactly about this. This Columbia River Gorge is a potential pathway for dispersal uh, between these two regions. Okay. And, and the reason that it has to be is that, you know, butterflies that live in lowland regions probably do so because they're adapted to that and climbing mountains isn't a part of their biology. Uh, they may come to that eventually, but it's just one of the things that in an immediate sense is, is not, um, is not uh, within their, their, their capacity. Likewise, uh, mountain, mountain things are, are not as likely to jump the gap because, you know, there's a river there and there's uh, lowlands and everything else. And there's quite a few butterflies uh, that are distributed in this region and in this region uh, that are different between the two regions. And so we have to look at, at, at corridors of dispersal. Montane <coughs> corridors, I mean, you're going to see a lot of things that are in common in the montane habitats. You're going to see a lot of things in common with lowland. Even though this isn't exactly a lowland habitat, it is a high uh, desert, which has uh, much in common ecologically with the Columbia Basin, okay? Now there's a few things we need to understand before we get too deep into the, the mapping, which is really where I'm headed and as, as, as quickly as possible. And, and one is adaptations and, and pre-adaptations. You can say, for instance, that an adaptation um, is something that a, an animal does to meet the needs of its, uh, of its, uh, its habitat. And, and it, you know, it's obviously, if you get to a place and you settle down and you start to become familiar, you become more and more adapted to the rigors of that habitat. But there's something about um, butterflies in the Northwest that all you should know, and that is that most of them weren't here 15,000 years ago. So they're all rather recent. And in fact, if you think about you know, uh, glaciation, it is something that's pulsed back and forth. And so this recency and uh, this constant uh, reoccurrence in an area from which uh, you've been vacated in a prior glaciation is a, is a fact of life in the Northwest. And this is part of the reason why we have rather relatively few species in the northern latitudes and relatively more species in the tropics is that in the tropics there isn't so much of this mass extinction, this fractionation and, and recompilation, but there's you know, nothing like glaciers to just wipe everything out. And then the other uh, aspect is pre-adaptation. And we consider the uh, European cabbage white, uh, the small white as they call it in Europe, as, as pre-adapted to North America. Uh, uh, I, I judge that to be so on the basis of the fact that it was first recorded in 1863 and then by 1890 it was transcontinental. Uh, it, it would seem to me that that uh, qualifies as a pre-adaptation to the North America. Uh, obviously a lot of uh, habitats in Europe are similar to those here, but I think the, uh, the predisposition of human beings to raise uh, brassicaceous plants, cabbage family plants, uh, gave it a, a, head, a head start. Another thing you need to think about is the notion of climax versus serial habitats. Okay, a climax uh, habitat is a habitat that, if left to itself, reaches a certain stage. Uh, we might call, for instance, uh, an old growth forest in uh, western Washington, a uh, hemlock dug fir forest in the lowlands of Puget Sound uh, with you know 250 foot tall trees, etc. Sort of a climax, you know. It's like it gets to a point where um, there's not much going to change. You know, trees will die, but there's old trees there. There's not much uh, new growth, not, not much uh, uh, a change in, 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 in the uh, structure of, of the species and whatnot in these habitats. Well, as we all know, that a lot of times you go into places that have been burned, the stages of recovery are exceedingly uh, important uh, to the you know, many different animals that utilize these interim stages. There's higher diversity of, uh, of herbs and, and forbs. And so it's very, very important um, for you know, a lot of creatures to have these cereal stages. Now, there are semi cereal uh, you know, like landslide, you know, avalanche uh, slopes and things like that. But in, in fact, uh, we can say that in some cases, um, you know, there's been a lot of catastrophic kinds of events that have been very important uh, historically. Volcanic events, for instance, uh, in and around, uh, right down here, there's all these pumice fields associated with Mount Mazama, and that imposes a specialized habitat. Uh, and around Mount Baker, we have a similar kind of thing where there's a, 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 a I don't want to say artificial habitat, but a, a habitat uh, imposed upon by uh, soil characteristics of, of drainage. 
And then we have a lot of species ranges right in this area here that are, have been impacted by the glacier peak blowout some years ago. So uh, the climax uh, sear uh, is a very important thing to think about. Uh, also in terms of the glaciers, you know, glaciers leave, they have this, uh, this rejuvenation of the habitat uh, post-glacial. Uh, that's a serial uh, 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 progression, okay? Um, another thing that's important is to uh, recognize that there's an upper and lower timberline. Everyone talks about timberline in the sense of the alpine timberline, but in fact, there is a low elevation timberline, and that is the, the, where a step meets the forest, okay? And this is a low elevation timberline versus a high elevation. You could go, for instance, from Mazama to Slate Peak, and you're kind of at the low elevations in Mazama, you see the, the open step country, and then as you get to Slate Peak, you get the high elevation. Now, structurally, um, the step and uh, alpine habitats are very similar. And in fact, um, step back, as you get into these regions here, the alpine corridors merge with the Arctic, they become the same. So that uh, higher and lower uh, uh, timberlines uh, absolutely become the same. It's important to recognize that happens, it's happened in our state. For instance, uh, Sheridan's Green Hair Street, which is uh, you know, largely found in you know, Columbia Basin and peripheral areas, extends all the way up to, uh, to alpine habitats in Slate Peak and, and all throughout central British Columbia. And that's because at one time, they were allowed to disperse into these alpine habitats. And then as the forests became predominant and separated the two uh, zones again, they just went their own ways. And so that's an important function of, of understanding how one adaptability can serve two purposes in terms of a, an eventual uh, distribution. Hey, John, where is Slate Peak? Ah, uh, right about there. Right there. Right. I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's the Okanagan Valley. Yeah, it's right about there. So. Okay, now the other, another thing that we need to look at is, uh, oh yeah, these are the life zones. Again, this is a, a fashionable thing. I mean, I, I don't really think this is Colorado. It's like, you know, 5,000 feet in Washington, you know, you get close to, uh, you know, uh, subalpine. You know, 11,500 feet, you're in, you know, permanent ice. But basically, you know, what we have is this uh, zonation that takes place over a mountain. Uh, I put that in there because it was a nice slide. This is a very nice slide. I'd like to pass it around sometime. I don't know if you can, I, was, I wasn't sure that you can read that, but you see potential evapotranspiration rate <coughs> ratio, and then here, it's annual precipitation in millimeters, and then this is biotemperature, which roughly coordinates the latitude. And so you see at the, at the highest latitudes, you know, way, way, way up here, you have essentially what amounts to the desert. And an ultimate desert is exactly that, deserted. No life, nothing. There's hard rock, nothing living there. That's like uh, the northern end of Ellsmore Island. And then as you go further down in latitude, you have these variations according to how much moisture is in the environment. And at the lowest latitudes, you go from rainforest to desert. Okay, desert seems to be a function of all, all of these um, latitudes, and that is, of course, a precipitation factor. Okay, now we're going to talk about refugia. And I want to do it in the context of, of like, what total uh, glacial mass. And this is, you know, nobody took a satellite photo of Pleistocene. <laughs> we didn't get one of those. But um, this is approximately, you know, what we're talking about. And you notice that with all this huge ice mass, you know, there are places that were unglaciated. Now, these are also functions of precipitation. There were areas that just didn't get enough precipitation for, uh, uh, for the snow. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't blasted cold, it, it surely was, but the fact is when you have areas that are unglaciated, uh, there's a potential for creatures to, to live there. In fact, a lot of these places um, in, in now are not much more hospitable than they were during the Ice Age. And so uh, the creatures that uh, were there are often still there. Okay? And you also notice that there's these corridors, ice-free ice uh, corridors. Now, that's Nobody knows this for sure, but there's enough evidence in uh, distribution of uh, uh, present-day distribution of different animals, and uh, some of the work that's been done with uh, you know uh, poor, uh, pollen samples from bogs and whatnot to establish that this is fairly likely. Also, humans are are considered to have dispersed down this corridor. That's the only way to explain uh, their presence in some places. So, when you have a situation, let's see, I'm going to do a little jumping around again. Okay, I wanted to show, this is what the, uh, the, the continental North America, again, not a satellite photo, 
uh, looked like about 3 million years ago before glaciation. And this is during the max glaciation, and this is what it looks like afterwards. You see that you know, the Hudson Bay was carved out. I mean, it was a major deal. It was about five or six miles deep, you know, and it was like grinding, um, grinding glass out of a telescope mirror. Okay, now this is, a, this is a better idea of what a refugium might be, and that is an area where, um, you know, ice does not cover the, ge uh, the geographic region. Um, it, it may be peripheral to um, in, in, in the ice mass, but there's reason to suspect actually there were refugia in the high Arctic. And a refugium simply is a place that's ice-free that is capable of supporting life and therefore becomes a reservoir for post-glacial dispersal. And we have a lot of reasons to believe this happened. Some of it provable. It's called Mount Ararat. Huh? Mount Ararat. <laughs> Who are you calling a rat? <laughs> oh, Ararat. John, yeah. why is that long strip, cross strip, not uh, considered a refugium? Um, it, it's. You mean the one that was on the previous map? Yeah. That yeah, thing? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's. It's hard, actually, to prove any of this. This is stylized, okay? This is even more stylized. You can kind of see, like, you know, what they were getting at here. But maybe, you know, there's, like, they were more interested, obviously, in this part, you know. Uh, of, and, and we'll, we'll get to some of that in, in a minute. i got to throw some stuff in here, okay, uh, before we get to the maps. I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time. Okay, now, vicariance is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, this is a kind of a stylized map, again, of, of what the, the world looked like at the lowest sea levels during the glacial maximum. Right, well, I'll, I'll just move on. This is, a, a, oops, uh, this is, you know, Chukotkin Peninsula, Kamchatka, and this is the Alaska, and the Aleutians and everything. You can see this one large landmass, and it was, again, as I mentioned, largely unglaciated. Well, this has, you know, two important factors that we have to consider. One is the large land mass that's not glaciated, it becomes a reservoir for dispersal. And by the way, this dispersal is it's proved to have gone both ways. Uh, taxa came from the New World, went to the Old. Taxa came from the Old World, went to the New. And we have reason to believe that some of them did, you know, twice. You know, came to the Old World and differentiated, came back to the New World as something different, okay? And, uh, you know, that's on uh, the basis of some of the molecular evidence. But it's, the important thing here is to recognize that well, this no longer exists. This became, uh, you know, no longer a corridor, but a barrier, all right? And, and that's a vicariant event. No longer is there free exchange across these two land masses between various populations on either side. And therefore, there's, you know, the opportunity for differentiation to take place. And, and therefore, uh, according to classic models of speciation, uh, the potential for the evolution of different species. Now, uh, there are interesting factors, volcanic uh, eruptions being another one of those things that can all uh, contribute to vicarian events. But another factor in uh, all of this, well, there's a, a, I borrowed this picture because it kind of brings you as a, a unit, it wasn't great, um, are re relictual populations. And we'll see, um, we'll see examples of this later on. That's where the main body of a range is uh, in one place, and then there's outliers that seem totally out of place. What, what that generally reflects is that there was once, time, uh, once upon a time a larger range, and uh, all the remains of that larger range are fragmented populations that managed to survive. And then there's what's called endemism, which is uh, the presence of, uh, uh, of a taxon in a uh, unique geographic religion, uh, religion region. Uh, Geographic religion. I'll I look into that, that you know. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> bottom line is that uh, en endemics can be identified more by the restriction of the range than by the cause for that. Now, nobody really been able to figure out uh, what's going on with that. We'll talk about that. Now, I want to get to dispersal because this is what's really going on here, all right? Um, the, uh, I, you know, I got to go through this. All right, this is a, a range that we see very frequently. It's modified, it's stylized. In other words, a basic boreal Rocky Mountain Cascade range. Um, it's important to recognize that if you look at where the glacier is and then you back up and look at this range, you can see that what the glacier does is essentially bisects this range, okay? 
And one can say, well, maybe the populations extend further to the south, or you can say all kinds of things, but it's very, very likely that uh, some uh, events, uh, and apparently from molecular data, uh, the, this kind of thing would separate uh, uh, what was a once continuous population into two. That's also uh, essentially a vicarian event. And, and you can see that, that there's potential for the same ice sheet, you know, that we're talking about here, uh, whoops, bumping, you know, uh, a population pushing it further south, and then after the glaciers leave, they move back in, you know, this is the Great Plains, it's like this is a natural quarter all the way up. We see a lot of populations, um, you know, of, 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 of different creatures, not just butterflies, that have a distribution like this, sometimes further to the east, sometimes further to the south. It's more uh, in terms of a, a, a model I'm kind of trying to establish here. And then this is a classic, this is the one that is more frequent. We see, uh, if you look at where that, that uh, glaciation is again, and then you look at a range like this, it's almost impossible uh, to, obviously, these populations weren't where they were during a glacial epoch. You could imagine this whole thing being shoved south, and so it's what they call it, the telescoping effect. Uh, they can only get shoved south so far, this is the Gulf of Mexico, and then maybe in hospital re in hospitable regions in Mexico. But the whole concept is that um, the movement of ranges. Now, you say this movement, it's not, it's extinction events a lot of times. Now, uh, these creatures are able to disperse, and of course, if it gets colder, you know, they're liable to move away or, or to just die out. So, extinction is a, 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 um, an important function of, of all of this at, um, in these uh, observations, okay? But you'll also notice that, you know, because you have this cordillera thing going on here, this mountains, the Rocky Mountains, that when the, when the glacial ice moves further south, the cordillera ice sheet. Uh, becomes uh, a prominent feature of, of the habitat, and that will end up separating east and west populations, which has also uh, been very apparent, as we'll see when we get to some, some maps. And, uh, well, and this is another example of, of a post-glacial distribution. Obviously, this whole range was under ice, so everything that's here is obviously a product of, of something that was south of the glaciers moving north, and this is a fairly uh, common distribution pattern that uh, we'll, we'll see. And then the last is the refugial. Uh, you can see that uh, if we, let's see if I, yeah. You see where the ice uh, was, and you can see where the ice-free area uh, was, and you see such a, a distribution pattern as this, that it's very easy to, I mean, it's, it's, it's less, let's just say it's more parsimonious to assume that this range distribution is a product of of dispersal from this ice-free area than it is to say that this was all south of the ice and it moved north and it's in hospital uh, and from an area that's now inhospitable to it. Um, I think it's, it's easier to see that you know, this Arctic distributions actually have um, a, a, a refugial origin. Okay. Now, we have to do a little review. All right? uh, basic butterfly behavior <coughs> is an important function of dispersal. Uh, you can say something like food plant assemblages are important if, you know, food plants are spotty, uh, butterflies move from one plant to the next, especially females, because we all know that males are useless bags of sperm. Um, females will, I didn't even get a chuckle over that. That's a first. We all know that. We all know that. <laughs> So now imagine that you have a little clump of food plants here and another little clump over here and another little over here. Now, maybe they'll all spend all their lives, you know, in, in this little clump, but, you know, probably not. Female maybe get blown away and there's another little clump over here, another one they get blown over here. And in the course of the season, if the total population, if you were able to measure, you know, 2,000 individuals from a complete population from the time their eggs were laid to the adult flying, and, and, and you found out that, you know, the average dispersal uh, from any given colony was 50 meters. Well, times 10,000 years, you know, that's movement, you know, that's movement. So, you know, the ability of even to move at small scales locally, you know, can imply the ability to move large scales geographically. Hilltopping is another example. A virgin female on goes to a hilltop to get mated because males are congregating there. Um, and the hilltop is, you know, uh, you could say it's radial. It's just a hilltop with lowlands all around it. It's just as likely to go one way as another, and that adds to the dispersibility. And then, of course, other mate locating behaviors. Uh, perching, not, not so much, but patrolling. If uh, males are patrolling, uh, they come across a female, and male, females move from an area. It, males, again, are fairly useless indicators of dispersibility.
But this is very important. Okay, now you have inter intrahabitat dispersal that takes place as a product of both food plants, mating areas, and nectar sources. Now imagine this is a little clump here. And you put another one over here, and you put one over here. You can imagine that it, through all these different activities, since a, a function of, of uh, you know, the biology of these creatures is moving from food plant to nectar source to mating areas, they're moving all the time. It's not so hard to imagine that, well, they go to another nectar uh, source over here that's part of another clump, or another one over here. Dispersal then becomes a function of, of these uh, species uh, behavior. And again, uh, the whole uh, nectar on the bottom of a, uh, uh, of a hill and, and mating areas on top, food plants in the middle. Anytime that you increase intrahabitat uh, movement, then you've increased the ability of that species, uh, or any, any creature, but especially butterflies, to disperse and to move. Uh, the 50 meters a year might, come, might become 1,000 meters a year, and they multiply that by 10,000 years, and, and it's not hard to imagine, you know, transcontinental movement. And we already know that the, uh, the, the, the small white butterfly managed that in less than 100 years, so there you are. Now, uh, seasonal migration is an interesting thing. Uh, David James, Dr. David James and I are, are working on a, a project together studying uh, Spiria coronis, the coronis spurlary, uh, because it has a, a very interesting uh, phenomenon. It's pretty much respect, uh, it's not quite like this. The food plants are all in the desert. They move in the spring up through the summer to the top of the, of the mountains and even really in, over to western Washington, and then in late summer and fall. We're getting uh, reports all the way through uh, September in and around Kittitas County and the lowlands in Chelan County of the, the adults moving back and down and laying their eggs, okay? so. That's a dispersal event. It's, it's a return, and you can say, well, you know, how much dispersal is actually going on? Well, who knows? I mean, and, and if things would change and, and, and adults went over the top, they would go down on the other side to find violence there and, and maybe survive if, if the climate was uh, sufficient to allow them to do so. But it's very uh, normal for a couple of our species to have yearly resident populations in one part of the state that disperse uh, ultimately across the whole state. Uh, orange sulfurs, I, you know, we see them all the way to Bellingham, but they don't generally uh, survive winters in western Washington, with some, you know, exceptions. Most of the time they're, they're surviving just in this area. So the, the, the fact that they can disperse that much, however, gives them a leg up on overall dispersal over time. And this is one of our classic uh, butterflies, the California tortoise shell, that uh, moves in huge numbers uphill uh, when it has, you know, boom years, uphill to the very top, exploiting the, the food plant at an optimal time for um, the, the, the food plant use, which is, it's a, it's, a, it's a plant high in tannins, so apparently it's nice to get in before the tannins kick your butt, you know. And then another one has the same uh, basic strategy, um, moving uphill each summer. And this is the butterfly that we're going to be working on, it's uh, the Cronus fiddler, it does the same thing. But, the idea is uh, to express um, what dispersal can actually do for you over the long term. I don't know why that it cut off the top. I may have cropped my slides a little bit uh, more than I wish. But at any rate, uh, this is a butterfly uh, that probably didn't have this range aboriginally. Uh, it's even hard to, to say um, that that's true or not because an 1881 survey shows that it was in Washington by that time. But it's a butterfly that moves. It's the orange sulfur, and you know, alfalfa is a primary food plant, and that has been grown agriculturally for hundreds of years. So it's really hard to tell just uh, how widespread this this was, and, and, you know, originally. And this is a butterfly we know is not resident in the Northwest, but here it is uh, distributed all the way up. I think there's even records for Alaska. So in a given year, they can move all the way from the Sonoran Desert to Alaska, and, and again, as a, as a migratory creature exploiting resources. And then uh, and, and removing uh, itself. And again, uh, the same with this butterfly, uh, the the Danaeus plexibus, the monarch. Okay. Every once in a while, you guys all use scientific names, and you don't know what they are. You have to fill in the uh, the gaps. Some of them I don't know the common names for. Lots of when you neglected to mention was a painted lady. Yeah, the painted lady. Right. Did everybody know it was a painted lady? Of all right. You did. Well, you didn't pipe up either. All right. Um, these butterflies don't live here, but they get here every year. Now, why? Well, there is the potential for them, you know, if the climate changes, to find a home here. I mean, the thing is, you have to look at things in terms of potential, because uh, weirder things have happened. Okay, now, okay, we're going to talk about refugial distributions. Uh, we talked about 
to have a refugium, the Arctic refugium uh, allowed Arctic distributions across the harshest climates in North America. I mean, even harsher than, uh, you know, the Sonoran Desert or even the Mojave. You know, some of them uh, are absolutely uh, desolate places. Okay, this is, this is the, uh, the Beringian, Beringian refugium here. And this is Coleus nasties, which somebody, I don't know why, uh, it's type locality is from Labrador, so they call it the Labrador sulfur. Anyone who's tried to catch them calls them nasty sulfurs. They fly about this far off the ground uphill. And I've never seen one go downhill. And, uh, it's just this unending supply of butterflies downhill flying to the tops of the hills. When you get to the tops of the hills, they're not there anymore. I don't know what it is. And they always fly faster than I can run, even when I was, was not so uh, robust. You like that word, robust? <laughs> All right. Now, this is the distribution in Canada. This is taken from uh, the butterflies of Canada. And uh, you can see that it's, it's really, it's, it's pretty high Arctic, okay? What you do see is this distribution down the Rocky Mountains. And uh, this is, as far as it gets, this is from the Mono website, and this is as far as it gets into, uh, into the continental United States. And this is this uh, distribution in BC. Well, now this is interesting because what this really implies, if you, you know, back up the line here, is that there is this uh, distribution in the Arctic directly from the refugium, then this distribution in the southern Rocky or the central Rocky Mountains that uh, almost reflects a, a vicarious event, okay? And, uh, and that's actually probably the case. We don't know that. You know, nobody's done a molecular study on this, but these populations here are probably the result of one invasion into this region and then they may hang, hanging out maybe in that refugium, that quarter we were talking about. Well, the ice sheets came, and then, and then you know, and then subsequent to that, this uh, reunification of ranges. Okay, but uh, nonetheless, it's still. I mean, these things very likely came from that same refugium uh, and the previous glaciation. Um, I can say it's probably uh, a guesswork on our part, but it seems very likely. And this is a butterfly that uh, we were just talking about a little while ago. It's the Beloria Astarte, the Astarte a lesser fritillary. Did I not say the common name of this one? Yeah, I did. You did. Yeah. And um, it, this is a, a, a high arctic butterfly uh, as well, not as high arctic as the arctic fritillary, but uh, this, this has a distribution that's largely restricted to the western part, widely distributed in, in, uh, in arctic, eastern arctic uh, Asia. Um, but again, you see this, this whole thing here is this distribution to the south, and as you can see again in these maps, you know, another distribution to the south, very similar to the last, and actually representing probably something of the same phenomenon. Um, these populations are probably the product of a previous uh, you know, uh, dispersal event, and then these populations here are the southernmost dispersers of the more recent dispersal event from the refugium. Um, and, and they're very different looking creatures, so much so that people thought that they were different species. Ironically, these things here, from here, from uh, our region, you know, fly up at Slate Peak, are very, very similar to things from southern portions of central Siberia. So it seems to be that their that they're actual phenotype, the way they, the reason they look so different, is more a product of, um, you know, latitudinal and or t uh, temperature and or uh, you know, moisture gradients, uh, that these things are responding you know, similarly to similar uh, habitats. Okay, this is one of my favorite butterflies. It's uh, Aeneas melissa, melissa's uh, arctic. Uh, it's like uh, brown. brown. Yeah. And that's like brown with little flecks, right? And they, they're totally cool butterflies. They, they live on rocks that, that look brown, brown yeah. <laughs> moss-likens and stuff like that. And, and they're really, really, uh, you know, in rocky habitats. Now their distribution in Canada, Canada reflects some of what we seen before. Oops. Well, come on now, be on my side. So again, we've got a distribution that's uh, very Arctic, and then a distribution that has this, uh, you know, peninsular effect down into uh, in, in, into the continental United States. Although these are. Uh, aside from one population in New Hampshire, these are the only continental records. And you might say, in fact, that, that the New Hampshire record is very interesting because it is a glacial relic. The nearest population is to it or all the way in Labrador. So at a time when, you know, the uh, glaciers were pushing south, there were populations south of the glaciers. 
uh, probably as a product of other dispersal events that did survive in the high mountains and the white mountains, as a matter of fact, uh, of New Hampshire. So these, again, probably reflect a past dispersal event, and then this is a more recent dispersal event. It's a pattern that recurs so often that we start to feel comfortable with that notion, which is probably a mistake, you know. This is the Arctic blue, my right, glandon. They call it the Arctic blue. And uh, this is a fascinating butterfly in as much as it has some of the same characteristics of the other butterflies and distributions we've talked about. It has this pan-Arctic, uh, all the way into Lapland, just like the Arctic fritillary. And then it has extensive populations in the lowlands of the prairies. And, and it extends well into the Cascades and into the Rocky Mountains. So this is a butterfly that actually is a, you know, its current distribution is, you know, reflects um, dispersal, vicariance, and redispersal, reintegration, okay? Now, I, I wrote something specifically uh, about it, but uh, it has, uh, yeah, it's an Arctic montane with adaptions to steppe prairie. Now, when I was in the Yukon, we found these things uh, uh, flying in habitats just like you find at Risa Creek. You had Parnassia smithius, uh, Euphidrius uh, anissia, Parnassia smithius, the smithius Parnassian, the uh, anissia, uh, check a spot, is that right? And uh, um, I think maybe one other butterfly that was almost identical to what you find at, at Risa Creek. But with the caveat, there were these little arctic blues all over the place. So um, they have made this adaptation. And again, it seems to be exactly uh, a case of, of the arctic or the alpine timberline and, and the uh, low elevation timberlines conjoining and, and allowing this dispersal between the two because the structural aspect of both the, uh, the arctic and the alpine tundras is identical and the, the food plants are, are available in both, either uh, at the genus level or at the family level. But this is especially interesting, let's go back to this. This is the distribution of this species in the continental United States. It has a vicarian in California and southern Oregon this is a butterfly um, who experienced the same kind of dispersal event, but it managed to get down into California. Now that must have been, you know, during a time when the climate was um, actually was much different, or possibly there was dispersal across the Great Basin. That's nobody really knows because whatever, it was a long time ago, and these and these butterflies have become different species, and and, and therefore. Uh, you know, it, it, they're obviously very similar species, but, but there's no doubt about there being distinct species. That's what can happen when vicarious uh, occurs. What was that species, John? Um, Podarchy. Uh, Plebeus Podarchy. Sorry. No, no, it's... Yeah, I don't know what the, um, I don't know what the common name is. I mean, it, it's tempting to say Podarchy Blue, you know. Yes. <laughs> Okay, now um, we have distributions that are boring, and, and we use that word uh, as, as different from um, Arctic because strictly Arctic is at the edge of the northern uh, tree line and conceivably, um, you know, into the high Arctic. But boreal includes everything in between uh, that and the prairies and the Cordilleran regions, and that's, oops, that's essentially this whole region here, okay? This butterfly is our Oregon swallowtail, which is considered to be Papilio macan, the old world swallowtail. And, uh, and we all, you know, we know and love this butterfly. We think of it as a step butterfly. But in fact, it's pan boring. It occurs across all of Eurasia and the whole Arctic, with extensions into temperate North Africa and even into the Himalayas. So it has the capacity uh, to adapt. It's not especially montane. It, it, it is in many places montane but it's uh, adapted um, also to step, as witnessed the Oregon swallowtail, as, also, uh, as well as tundra. And it's possible that, um, that these things are actually, um, it actually represents what might be called a super species. In other words, a species whose internal complexity is more differentiated than you know, a normal species. It has components of several different um, events of, uh, of differentiation and, and between which it, it, they're all the same species, but they're all kind of a little different, you know, in, in some ways. It's a, an intermediate concept uh, between species and subspecies, and it's finding more utility, you know, at least as a, a, a term um, enabling communication. Well, this is the distribution in Canada, and this includes 
several different subspecies. This is very typical of, of you know of the old world subspecies. This thing really actually looks like things you get in, in Britain. These things in here are, are kind of a different sort of a thing, uh, reflecting um, influences from other in, in the McCain group, which includes the black swallowtail, etc. And then these things in here are actually more like Oregonia. Well, well, the North, uh, the, the continental uh, United States distribution reflects, you know, that it, it's not found in some of these places that are, you know, extremely dry. Maybe these are under collected too, but it has a, quite a penetration. You think about the mass that we just looked at, and it's all the way to the Arctic coast in, in Alaska and the Yukon, all the way to the Mexican border. So it's a butterfly you have to consider um, very, very adaptable. But again, pretty much restricted to the western United States. And again, that's the distribution uh, in the, from the butterflies of BC, which is, by the way, online. That's where I got these images. Now, this is a butterfly called uh, Beloria bologna. Is that meadow fritillary? Wait, Beloria, which one? Bologna. Come on. No, that's not, that's not western. Bologna. It's western. Not the western meadow fritillary. Just the meadow fritillary. Okay, this is another butterfly that has, this is like what I would call a classic boreal distribution. You know, into the taiga and penetrating the prairies to some degree, and then actually all the way up into the Yukon. Um, it's a forest species with an adaptation to the steppe prairie transition zone. That's what we find in, in Washington. It has a tremendous uh, penetration into the eastern United States. A lot of people think that this it's really become much more common there because it is a, a denizen of old fields, um. otherwise called waste areas, you know. So it, it is a, a, a trashy butterfly, my favorite kind. <laughs> these are uh, its distribution in Washington, and these, these are, are you know, pretty uncommon down here. I'm, I'm pretty sure that these haven't been duplicated. This actually has, I think, but um, it's not so uncommon up here, and certainly it's, it's not so uncommon in this area. These are, are, are uh, butterflies that um, have penetrated into our part of the world from the boreal um, distribution, which suggests that they actually came uh, essentially from eastern United States to get here. And then uh, this is Valoria Freya. Whoa. Yeah, it's a nice one. Off of Butterflies of America. David Shaw's our own. He's a Seattle doctor. You know him. Right? And uh, again, a typical boreal distribution. Uh, pretty, pretty high in the Arctic as well. Um, it, it barely gets into the United States, and, and, and this distribution reflects a relictual distribution of a previous uh, dispersal event, whereas this and this are part of the same boreal element. Um, and again, you can see you know, the same you know, kind of thing. It's penetration from the south, barely getting into the state from the north. You know, we'll see that there's from the north, and there's from the south, and there's relatively few that are our own homegrown. But, oh. yeah, go ahead. The name, Clasiana? Oh, that's, this thing here, yeah. that's, that's just John Shepard, you know, that's Beloria. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know it, it, splitters, lumpers, what are you going to do with them? Is that a splitter or a lumper? That's a splitter. And, and he's not normally a splitter, but Beloria, you know, there's a rule amongst the systematists, you know, if you're interested in the group, it's likely to be split, you know. <laughs> Is that not so, Rod? Well, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, more of a splitter of species level and more of a lumper in higher category, so you never know. I'm sure glad I asked. <laughs> okay, now, we're going to, the interesting thing about this distribution is that um, this has happened apparently more than once. I mean, there's been all kinds of, of uh, movement uh, from the glacial refugium, and maybe boreal elements, who really knows? Because there is a sibling species in this group, and this is fascinating. This is a normal Freya uh, lesser fritillary. Do they just call it the Freya fritillary? They don't call it the Freya lesser fritillary. And this is his sister, and that's called the Loria Navajati. Some people call it the Relic fritillary. Isn't that a cool creature? It's even cooler on the underside. Um, and this is a normal uh, a Freya fritillary, and this is a uh, um, uh, Nadajani. And uh, say that name again. Nadajani. Not uh, not Tajani. Come on, not man. N a t a z h a t i. It's Russian. Yeah. 
It's from uh, Mount Natashat, and uh, I'm sure you needed to know that. The cool thing about this is you can't see is the size difference. Uh, the Freya is about uh, maybe an inch across. These things are almost two inches. The first one I ever saw in my life I thought was an Arabia because it just was humongous. It was too big for a lesser Fred. But So that shows you that, you know, this is the magnitude of, uh, of what differentiation can lead to. Okay, now, amazingly, we're talking about what butterfly? Come on, ID. People. That's right. <laughs> this is the baby we was talking about. I, I thought this is a certain irony. That's kind of cool. This is a butterfly whose distribution is both high Arctic, as I, as I was saying, penetrating well to the south, and as you can see, well into um, you know portions of the Northeast, well into the Rocky Mountains. Um, again, uh, the product of several dispersal pulses from this, these refugia, and uh, again. What you can see here is the differentiation. We'll look at uh, images. Our Rhaenyrae and, and these Butlerai things, these are basically the same. These things are, are wacko things. It's part of a, a as, I, as I say here, a highly adapted to vicariance, a bog fan adaptation and an Arctic alpine tundra adaptation. Ours are, are the Arctic alpine tundra uh, these here are also they're found at high elevations, and it's only when you, you get up to here that they're found actually at sea level along. And again, that's a merging of the two tree lines, okay? But the, uh, the two phenotypes are actually remarkably uh, different, okay? Uh, the, this is uh, the, the, the Arctic Alpine thing, and this is the, uh, the bog dwelling thing. And, and you can see there's elements in the patterns that are the same. And what's really fascinating, if I had more time, I'd go with Oh, these actually, uh, in terms of how different they appear here, if I had more time, I would have had 30 or 40 images up there and show that in places in, in the Yukon and the, in Alaska and then all across, um, let's go back to the big map here, all across this area here, they all merge. So there's no doubt about the fact that there are, are two different uh, uh, phenotypes, but they're there's also no doubt about the fact that they're conspecific. It's only when you get into uh, the Yukon that you, you get really remarkable things happening. Well, actually, you can see it in this map here. You've got these things here, which are almost exactly like our Rhaenyrae, but then in the low elevations all around them, you've got those other bog dwelling things that are dark, smudgy looking, you know, not nearly the same kind of, of, of creature at all. And, and yet, but they don't have anything to do with each other ecologically. It's because where they converge is elsewhere on the planet. So if you were just living in this region, you'd think, well, it's easy. They're two different species. But, um, you know, when you have a more comprehensive look, and that's what a biogeographer is required to do, you can see that they're, uh, they're part of a, a the same species complex. Yeah, okay, okay. Oh, this is another one of our uh, Washington butterflies. I used most butterflies that were in Washington. This is Gloria Cellini, the bog fertilary. Is that right? Bob for mm -hmm. Come on! It's got a lot of yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we'll go with Bob for later. I mean, you know, it's a, a widely distributed species as well. This is panboreal, that means across both uh, hemispheres. A bog fen species, and it's narrowly limited to that habitat. Uh, but interestingly enough, in the boreal area, bog fens are incredibly common. You know, uh, a bog might extend for you know, almost 50 square miles. So, like, that's a perfect place for a butterfly like this. Who is that guy? Anybody want to? Yeah. yeah, that's that's our buddy from Spokane. And uh, this is again the, the, the just again perfectly. You know, it's like I showed you the map and I showed the boreal distribution. Well, this is you know, I've been showing you map after map with the same kind of, of pattern. So it's like you know, we're not making this stuff up. It actually exists. This, in this case, it again stands uh, further south. And you can see, if you look at the two maps of the distribution, this is an extension south from that boreal uh, distribution. It may actually be that these populations represent um, populations that were there during glaciation, and they are the ancestral ones, and the ones in the north are the ones that, that uh, are, were colonized. But that's uh, neither here nor there. Or there could have been both. Huh? There could have been both. Uh, probably, yeah, probably. Um, it, 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 the process of dispersal does not eliminate the possibility for differentiation, absolutely. And, uh, and this is the distribution of the Northwest. You can see 
And if you went further the south here, you wouldn't see any spots. <laughs> so this is pretty much the southernmost uh, distribution in the northwest. There's another butterfly that gets here from the north and, 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 and not further south. And uh, yeah, yeah, this is uh, the hoary elephant. Is that right? That's Can I say hoary? Is that the uh, PC? Yeah. It's as in frost. Oh, it's in frost. Oh, all this time I thought it was something yeah, much worse. Sure. All right. Um, this is a food plant limited species, and so that imposes itself on their range. Um, it feeds on Arctostaphylos euberersi. It's boreal, but not Arctic. Um, a forest species, right? Kinnikinnik. Kinnikinnik, yeah. You didn't know what Arctostaphylos euberersi was? I did, that's why I said Kinnikinnik. This is penetrating into montane areas, uh, mostly in the Rockies. Yes, again, that familiar boreal distribution pattern. Uh, obviously penetrating pretty well into the Rockies and then along the East Coast. This is probably relictual. In other words, it was probably more widely distributed at one time and um, either you know became extinct as a, as a product of climate, ch climate, climate change or uh, you know human induced and those, those damn humans you know they get in the, in the way of everything natural and this is a distribution in the, in the northwest now there's a one more dot further south in California but this is essentially as far south as it gets and again repeating the pattern of the boil distribution that uh, barely gets into our part of the world now we're going to get uh, into strictly uh, western United States. And this is a, a butterfly that we all know and love, the Clio Indra Indra Swallowtail. I mean, I think it's a pretty cool butterfly myself. And you can see its total range, if you exclude the, the little bit that's up here in BC, is in the western United States. And, and you know, this looks like it gets all the way into Baja California. That's not so. It gets into right here. But uh, that's the problem with Bomona maps is that they do it county-wise, and some of those counties. Huge! You know? So, um, it's distribution in the Northwest. And it's obvious that, you know, we talked about the boil distribution barely getting, well, this is a reverse. This is a distribution from the West that just barely gets into, B, into BC. And it's really interesting because it's not an uncommon butterfly in the right places in Washington. But the only place it's found in BC is an adjacent slight peak in the highest elevations. It doesn't get up the Okanagan River Valley at all. So, um, and this is a butterfly that probably came to this state after the glaciers and, 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 and just barely made it into, this is a, in, into BC. This is another butterfly, it's uh, Chloe Asanides. Um, interesting butterfly in that uh, it's a member of a whole arctic group. And in fact, if you went to Europe, you would see these butterflies and say, hey, it looks like Asanides. I mean, they're very, very similar butterflies flying in Italy and France um, and, and most of Southern Europe. And, uh, and yet, um, it, it, it is a, a very distinctive element, barely getting into the, into the uh, boreal region at all. It's uh, a good dispersal. So it, this range uh, reflects you know, the, the ability uh, for it to disperse. It may be that these things here, it's Ogilvia, is a, is a name of the Ogilvy Mountains in Yukon. So it may be that that's a refugial uh, population that uh, sustained uh, through the last glaciation, and, uh, and, and then subsequently they were, they're, they're very similar butterflies anyway. So it's not like, the most interesting thing is there's another little endemic thing here, you know, uh, that's the Insulana that's up there in the Santa Juans and the Vancouver Island. And, and that is actually probably um, a product of dispersal uh, during a period of time when these butterfly populations occupied the Puget Trough. Now, I would be interested, interested in doing molecular work because I suspect that these things here actually have more to do with things you can't see in Oregon down here, that they're a product of an actual coastal distribution. But, or coastal refugia. Well, right, because we've got some others, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, but, you know, until we actually do that work, you know, it's going to be pretty hard to, to ascertain. Uh, now we get into check spots, and I mean, like, wow, what a mess. These are cool. These are. Uh, the colon, the snowberry checker spot, Ephidrius colon. And we're going to get into one of the problems with checker spots generally is that, uh, oh, who's that? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, it, 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 this is a distribution for uh, the variable checker spot. You know, at the time when no one was differentiating all of them, that's the combination of three different checker spots into one distribution pattern, okay? This is uh, what they had for identified colon, and that's just the problem because actually 
colon distribution includes all of this area. In fact, our VC map shows a, a better distribution. Now, that is a vicariant event that we don't understand very much about right now because its relationships to Chalcedona have obfuscated, you know, things that have happened in the past. So we're in the process of, of figuring it out. Most important thing is to recognize that this is a western butterfly that has really dispersed, and actually this Yukon population is now, it's dispersed quite a ways up north, which reflects that there must be some kind of a, a conduit, some kind of a dispersal corridor that we're not familiar with. And then this is Edith's check spot. This is, these two are, are tailors. You know Fred, right? No. Really? No. Oh, wow. And, uh, and then has, again, a western distribution, which is uh, really pretty fascinating, uh, very differentiated throughout this region. Uh, and, and, and it's, it's uh, again, reaching its you know, upper, this is as far north as it gets, right in here. And uh, highly differentiated, probably it's a complex of semi-species. In fact, it may be a superspecies, there may be more than one, but it's um, basically um, all the way from alpine to steppe habitats. Even in Washington, you have populations from the, the, the Puget Prairies, uh, uh, San Juan, Straits of San Juan, right above the salt spray, uh, all the way to like Slate Peak, and, you know, well above Timberline. Oh, I don't know if I forgot to tell you that if you have questions, you can ask them. It doesn't seem that the, you were hesitating. But, uh, this is the arrowhead blue, Wakasaiki piasis. Another, I mean, if you notice that these maps, one after the next, you're just like, wow, they're all kind of like in the same ballpark. Well, that's because there's another uh, conformity around a pattern of distribution, which reflects a basic continuity um, of uh, a, 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 a proximity to a cause, all right? And again, barely getting into uh, Canada, we are near the north limit of this distribution. Uh, Hesperia, yeah. Nevada, the Nevada Brandon Skipper. Is that right? Nevada Skipper. Nevada Skipper. Such an original. Name? I would have called yeah. it a super cool green ventral hindwing skipper. <laughs> right. um, while this distribution pattern is quite like the others, it's not even accurate in as much as if you actually see the dots. They're highly clustered in very um, uh, sporadic fashion. And uh, the behavior is an important factor in, in this. And, and maybe that may be as important as anything in terms of, of finding them. It may be more widespread. This behavior is so unusual. Uh, cuprius, uh, Lycina cuprius, the lustrous copper. Man, that, that's amazing. I'm picking this stuff up, you know. You know, not bad for an old guy. Huh? This is a, a butterfly. It's very interesting in that it has two bicarbonate populations as well. And you just saw examples of the two. You know, dorsally, you know, you have kind of a warm coppery color. Eventually, you know, see this uh, nice orange and, you know, kind of a, it's a warm color. Whereas this is a like colder, and, and you know, you see how pale lemon that is. One is the, um, the typical cuprius, and the other is what they call the snow white. And it, we get in this, you know, this is its total distribution uh, in, in Congo, in the United States, and we'll get it into, into, into BC and Canada in a minute. But this actually reflects uh, two very possibly dis distinct species. Uh, the true cuprius occurs. In, in this region, into Montana and into California, in this area, snow white occurs all the way up into here. That's what we get in our state is the snow white types, and and you can see that this distribution is actually uh, pretty discreet. They overlap in Montana, but one's on top of the other. One's in the you know alpine uh, snow uh, screes, and the others in the, in you know montane meadows. So. Um, the interesting thing about that, going back to here, is it's, why is it in, in Washington? There's a lot of habitats that it occurs in Oregon that should be over here, where again, that's actually a barrier. And where it gets over here is through the, across the Ochoco Gap into the northeast corner of Bourgogne. It's under, understandable, but there's one more county that's not on this map. Okay, Edith's copper. This is a cool butterfly because it's expanding its range. And I actually better pick up the pace here. All right. Now we'll just look at these pictures. That's Edith's copper, Lysina Edith. 
And again, the same kind of thing here. It gets across into, into the Rocky Mountains by way of the Oakville Gap in Oregon. It does catch the southeast corner of Washington, but now we know that it's actually all through here. It's expanding its range. This is a butterfly that human activity has probably helped. It's, uh, it feeds on weedy uh, rumex and, and, uh, and, you know, like, uh, uh, what's that root common? See the Stella? Is that the common one? Yeah. Uh, what is the common name for that? Sheep uh, sorrel? I, 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 I like to call it sour duck. Sour duck, duck yeah. in there in the south. Right. So it, it just, you know, uh, I think a lot of us were at uh, Tiger Meadows when there was a uh, cotton for the county record. Well, now it's like dirt common in Tiger Meadows. It's just everywhere. And it's expanding its range into other counties. So, uh, again, primarily western distribution. It doesn't get into BC, although it will be shortly. Coming All right. Soon. Huh? Coming soon. Coming soon to you, like Campestris. This is Coleus Alexander. That's a cool butterfly. Coleus Alexander. Uh, again, a western distribution with extensions into Canada. Just repeating the theme, okay. Uh, Colophus of Phineas, the immaculate green hair streak. I picked a fairly immaculate specimen to show. Probably the same specimen now that I've looked at it. No, maybe not. Uh, they're not always immaculate. Um, this is another problem with green hair streaks is that this is the distribution of the immaculate green hair streak according to one criterion. And this is a, 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 one of the components of it on the Bomona site. But an actual fact of the matter, the real immaculate green hair snake is a western butterfly with a pattern very similar to the, what we've been seeing. The butterfly formerly known as Perplexa is going to have its name changed back. We have an application to the ICZ and it's going to make it Colophorus dumatorum forevermore. Let's hear it for that, huh? Yeah. You don't even know what that's about. Well, this as a, a product of dispersal, obviously post-glacial, um, because that's the, 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 you know, the, the pattern that it shows is, you know, the glaciers left it, moved over into the, the Rocky Mountains. This is our only endemic Pacific Northwest butterfly. No, you don't get, you don't care. Somebody, somebody? Vindlers, and what? Arabia. Vindler, we'll just go with that. You got Arabia, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Vidler's Alpine, Arabia, Vidlerite. This is its total range in the world. The cool thing about this butterfly is that uh, its closest relationships are in Asia. I mean, the oh. butterflies most closely related to it are in the Far East. Yeah, you got a question? No. I hope not. You're usually trouble, you know what I'm saying? You ask me something, I have no idea. <laughs> now, this is a butterfly called the... Uh, uh, well, it's called red spotted purple or the white admiral, but they're all the same species. And what we're going to do is go through a couple of slides here. You can see that you know, this is the, the white admiral, this is the hybrid, this is the... Uh, well, they're not really hybrids because they perfectly blend into one another. Okay, and you know, as an example of that, I'm going to go through a bunch of slides here. Okay, I'm just going to slide through, slide through, like that. And, and, uh, John, yeah. the cool thing about these closely related laminitis is they have different visual pigments. Do they? Yeah. Is it related? We're working on this. Yeah. Right? Is it related to the systematics of the group at all? Or is it to the Well, if the systematics were actually understood, we don't know. I don't know. Oh, all right. Well, we're, no, they're we're trying to figure that out. They're pretty well understood, but it'll be interesting to see how your results uh, you know, parallel them. Yeah. I mean, basically, what we have here is a series of images that show. You know, for instance, a you know, typical white admiral with not so typical white admiral. These are all actually taken in the same place. Yeah. Right. So, like, you know, it's like this little question of what's going on here. A little hanky panky, you think, huh? And uh, the viceroy's in there. Huh? Well, that could happen. The viceroy's in there. Uh, <laughs> that's why we, that's, we don't have a problem uh, with these things, you know, uh, doing the little hanky panky because. Um, viceroys, which obviously is a distinct species from all, will also do the same thing and hybridize with all these other species. And uh, they don't look so tidy. The adults are really wacko. But are, is there any separation by gender in those photos? Um, males no, no. I think we flipped them. Up. It, 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 there's a um, like that's a female. That's a male. That's a female. That's a male. I mean, they're just wow. no, yeah. Okay. 
Remington has some gyandromorphs in these things. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, even when you get a gyandromorph in the hybrids, uh, it's really weird looking. Yeah. Now, these are the white banded, um, and these are the uh, red spotted. And you can see that there's actually uh, a lot of overlap. And of course, I, you know where we got the sample? <laughs> it was right there. You see, that's where you get those uh, you know, whacked out things. Now, it turns out that these, the red spotted um, purples, are highly associated with the range of uh, Batis phylonor, the uh, pipeline swallowtail. And in fact, they converge on, on that pattern, the reflecting blue, uh, non-limon non, non eye pattern um, is definitely more like the phylonor. And so, highly selected for in that range. But uh, I wanted to get, I'm almost done, guys. I uh, wanted to get through the, the this is um, Papilio canadensis, the Canadian tiger swallowtail. Um, and we get these barely into our state, you know, they don't show these, these spots. So they have these little purple spots that they, they call um, C or Canadensis across the brutalist. But, you know, uh, you guys may have seen Dave Nunley's specimen he brought down here. And, and we get them uh, with some frequency in the Similcomane and in that region. And then this is, of course, our, our uh, western tiger swallowtail. You can see that there's really some dramatic differences if you look at you know, these orange spots here and then this orange uh, on, on this portion of the wing, you know, they're just, you know, they're not orange and there's just no orange there. That's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. And then this is the distribution of, of rudderless. Should, you know, jump back. There's the distribution of canadensis. So you can see there's really quite a bit of overlap. And the, uh, the, the amount of intergradation is not great. And the individuals that are integrated are not uh, numerous. So it's, they're pretty obviously distinct species with a tendency um, to mismate. Now we have here the two range maps, okay? And this is Papilio guacus, which is the east. That wasn't bothering me at all. This is the eastern tiger swallowtail, and this, whoops, and, yeah, and this is the western tiger swallowtail. And you can see how, yeah, and you see how they're, they're almost exactly opposite one another, but not quite. And in the areas where they come into contact, well, these are the product in fact, all three, the Canadian tiger swallowtail very probably was in the Arctic Refugium. Uh, Western tiger swallowtail is very largely isolated west of the Rocky Mountains. Eastern tiger swallowtail very likely was isolated east of the Rocky Mountains during glacial maximum. At the last one or the one before that, who knows. But, uh, and these are the product of vicariant uh, uh, um, evolutionary events. Ah, there we go. So, I only have one interview. What was that? Did I do that? I wanted to say one more thing, okay, and that is this thing called phylogeography. This is going to be really cool. This is where uh, we become so facile with molecular techniques that we're able to employ them at the local level, all right, so that we can go from one ridge top to the valley to the next ridge top to the valley and get nice genetic, nice gene sequences. We're not interested in specific identities here, we're interested in lineages. And we will know immediately if we have different lineage because the relationships established from one ridge to the next to the next will immediately show when we get to one that's different from that. Now we would expect to see some variation because life is like that variable. But the interesting thing is that with this technique we will be able to see some real evidence of past events and they will be traceable through the, the molecular lineages. A new science, it's very sexy, it's almost as cool as conservation biology. Alright, any questions? Yeah? Is trashy habitat the key to dispersal? Well, not necessarily, but certainly um, uh, anticlimax is. I mean, there's anything that, that destroys um, a, a climax, which you know, creates opportunities. And so, like, yes, in a way, if you can imagine trashy habitat before Europeans, all right, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You know, it's, it's a riverine habitat where floods occur uh, frequently, it's avalanche slopes, it's those kinds of habitats. So, yeah, in a sense, trashy habitats are key. But old field, the old field habitat, it's turning out to be very, very interesting, especially in the eastern United States. Uh, you know, agricultural fields that have just, you know, laid fallow and start to grow back with no attention turn out to be really, really good places for a lot of creatures. And, um, you know, studying that phenomenon uh, will, you know, open our eyes to the conservation priorities and, and, and maybe how to attain some of the uh, objectives that, that we might have. Yeah. Any more? Yeah.
I appreciate that you kind of centered all of this around us basically in a very large way. And a lot of it's about uh, ICE. But if you did all of this talk and it was about Ecuador or someplace, would that be relatively boring by comparison? Because it's just tropical. And this is out on that edge, as you were saying, which is interesting. Well, I would say this. First of all, if I gave a talk about Ecuadorian butterflies, it would be fantastic. <laughs> and I mean that in the truest sense of that word. Because I'd be making it up. All right. right. But I would say um, that my Ecuadorian friends tell me that Ecuador is an amazing place with diversity montane to uh, sea level that's the equivalent of, of anything we have. But see, it's a different magnitude. So I would say, yeah, I, a lot of people would say that, you know, that the, the you know, periglacial habitats are most interesting, certainly in, in Russia, the Russians think so. Um, they're interesting in that we have absolute, absolute bottom line there are no butterflies under the ice. So we can start from this point. Anything that's there now happened in this amount of time, so we can say something absolutely. So, uh, but no, I think it's interesting everywhere. I was gonna Aren't say- there blues down there that came from Russia? What's that? Aren't there blues down there that came from Russia? Oh, you've been reading the wrong stuff, man. No, <laughs> they didn't come from Russia. The ones in Russia came from there. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, there was a, uh, uh, oh, that was basic butterfly biology. We had my base, or, or biogeography, we had my basic butterfly biology. My next two were going to be intermediate butterfly biology, intermediate butterfly biogeography, where we encompass more global aspects. John, do you have any examples you could share with us where the um, genetic tools that you were describing have been applied to particular species? So, and can you share with us what has been learned about the range over time? Well, it's, uh, there's, there's three species that have been examined, all of them European. One is Arabia tenderis, which is a really interesting butterfly because it's uh, almost all, everybody's leaving. Oh, shoot. All right. uh, it, it's very interesting because it's a belongs to a complex of species uh, that uh, maybe 12 of them all together that are high, largely differential on the basis of chromosome alone. So they were very interested in looking at these things and, and, and seeing what the differences were biochemically between them uh, and tinderous, and then especially what the relationships were between various tinderous populations, because all of these are exceedingly colonial. They don't, they don't form parts of metapopulations. It's like each colony is on an isolated ridge somewhere, right? And what they showed was a remarkable uniformity. So uh, that's what you'd expect, for instance, if you went from ridge to ridge to ridge in Washington. You went to Wenatchee Mountains, you went to Antioch Ridge, and you did sampling like that. Um, and, 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 and that's, I mean, in terms of a predict, if you're going to predict beforehand. As to whether or not any of those things uh, actually represent um, historical events, you can't be sure. But, you know, certainly, if you were going from ridge to ridge to ridge, and then you got to, like, the Okanagan Valley, and then all of a sudden you got the Okanagan Highlands, and whoa, you had a whole different... Um, you know, uh, genetic arrangement. I mean, you, you, you're looking at something there that's more significant. That's what you're really looking for, not the conformity to a pattern, but the, the, the discordance to a pattern. And so, yeah, nobody's really, well, they're doing it, but it hasn't been published. Yeah. And they're really not doing it in the Northwest, unfortunately. I mean, I don't know why this is the best place in the world, because there's no butterflies. And so the ones you got, you have to really work hard for, you know, and you get the riches that way. All right, any more questions? Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, with the possibility of global warming, do you see the spread vertical or horizontal? First of all, there is no such thing as global warming. Man, don't you ever watch Fox News? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> global warming, it really, it should be climate change, and that's I not happening either. You know? I, that's not happening either. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, actually, I, I suspect that, you know, of course, the ultimate effect of global warming is glaciation. You know that, don't you? Because you warm, you melt, and you cut off you know, all these currents that warm the oceans, all right? And you create a new glacial epoch. I don't know that either. Nobody does. But I wouldn't say that um, we can make those kind of predictions. We had a lady uh, uh, you know, talk about Adelopides uh, campestris sacum and its invasion of Northwest as a product of, uh, of global warming. Or, you know, she kind of 
Climate change. Climate change, right? Lisa. Yeah, she suggested that. I, I think that it, you know, it's uh, it's perilous to claim such a thing. You don't know. Um, yeah, you'd expect that if it you know got warmer, that you know things that were warm adapted, you know, would take advantage of you know warmer climates. But you know, really, the whole place has been under sample, and so we don't know that just more eyes looking hasn't been a part. In the case of the sacum, I think it's obvious that it's done something, but I, it could be just adaptational. It might not have anything to do with uh, with actual climate change, because I don't think um, that it's it's adapted to you know, uh, uh, you know enduring as bad a weather as as it's had to endure the last couple of years, and yet it has endured. So um, you know that's pretty much a historical fact that we've seen it move in through Oregon and into Washington, and I think it's an adaptational thing. Everything wants to survive. Everything will do everything it can to survive, and that's an example. Yeah, this isn't going to be hard, is it? I, I, I was just going to enlarge on the same question. I remember reading a study comparing locality records of European butterflies over approximately 100 years. In Europe, they can do that. And, and, they, and as I recall, they found that uh, the vast majority had shifted about 100 kilometers north or so over that period of time. That was the work by Dennis, right? I don't, I don't remember anything more about it. I'd look it up. Well, actually, um, that's subject to some of the same problems. Uh, I, I don't, I don't discredit him. I just say that anytime people start talking about global kinds of things, are they operating on uh, on data they don't have, you know, because we just haven't been around. There are some spider species that have shifted uh, uh, their distribution northward, uh, like in the last uh, 25 years or so, and there was no earthly reason. Why they couldn't have done it sooner, uh, except for climate change. Well, wait a minute. There's another earthly reason. How many people collect spiders? How do you know they weren't the, there? I mean, nobody's going to fail to notice Arnulfi arandia if it was there. You say that. I, I bet you have the people here don't know. <laughs> they might not know what the hell it is, but they'll notice it. 